John Iveson is a political columnist for the National Post based in Ottawa, Ontario, and was part of the newspaper's founding team. He joined the Post in 1998 from the Scotsman in Edinburgh. He worked at the Financial Post for five years, becoming deputy editor, before moving into politics, first at the Ontario Legislature in Toronto and then on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. He regularly appears as a panelist on various Canadian public affairs programs, including CPAC's Primetime Politics and CTV's Power Play with Don Martin and Question Period. The book, your first book, is entitled Trudeau, The Education of a Prime Minister. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. The last line of text in the book the very last line, because it's part of the acknowledgments. I just want to get this right here. It talks about the fact that your family and your wife taught you how to be content. So how do you be content? Well, you start with the easy question, then. Eh? Um, well, I've had uh, a bit of a tumultuous personal life until the last four or five years, and... and this year I had a, a book and a baby. And, uh, How old are you now? 53. So I'm uh, verging on being too old to pick the, the wee man up. But uh, <laughs> um, nobody has yet asked me whether I'm the grandfather, thankfully. But yes, so I was thanking my wife, who's a diplomat, Dana, and uh, my older children, who are uh, one of whom has just started at McGill, James, and Fiona, who's in grade 10, and William, who is eight months today. Congratulations. Thank you. You didn't answer the question, though. Well, I think having... The, I mean, I'm clearly blessed to be in a position where I'm... I've got a front row seat at the, the history unfolding in, in, in Canada. I've been blessed to be able to write a, whatever I want as, in, a, in a book, which has appear, apparently been widely read. Certainly it was the number one bestseller in Canada in the non-fiction sections in both the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. Yeah, what, the, just, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? How many books is that? I don't know. Don't I you don't get a, a readout every week not of how many books basically. are sold? No. They, the they may have one, but I have not asked for one. And you haven't had your checks yet? Well, the way that this particular deal is done, and I have no idea whether this is typical, is that it was in four parts. So on signing, on delivery of the manuscript, on publication, and I think when the paperback comes out, if there is one. I see. Okay. So I feel very blessed. So success gives you contentment then? Uh, you're putting words in my mouth to say that. I, I mean, I, I feel blessed in having a, a, a loving family and for everybody to be healthy and well and happy and to be able to do what I want to do. I mean, this is a terrific job. You know, you're you're indoors. There's no heavy lifting. Um, you get ink all over your fingers, though. Well, you used to. It's uh, less so now. I mean, we, we were ink-stained wretches. Whatever the technology has de developed, so the ink doesn't come off anymore. But um, but I've had a, a great career in, a, in an industry that is not thriving. Yeah. And I think I'm in a fortunate enough position. I don't particularly worry about all the turmoil and that I think I've hopefully reached a stage where I will find something whatever happens and that is not the case with all of my colleagues this industry when I started in this bureau the Ottawa bureau of the of the what is now post media but at that point was southern news there were 38 people we went down to two we are now back up to seven but mainly younger people without much experience and they're probably not being paid as well as they used to be paid. So content, yeah, I feel that I've, I'm where I want to be in life and that is contentment. You don't need to strive all the time for money, for power, for women, for whatever else. That, yeah. that, that uh, I think that's contentment. You think uh, Justin Trudeau is content? I think politicians are different from you and me. Well, they're liars for one thing. Well, that's 
liars is a harsh word. They they <laughs> they mostly tell the truth, but not the whole truth. Um, sure. <laughs> um, I think that when you sign up to be a politician, you inevitably uh, sell your soul to to some extent, and that every single transaction thereafter, you think, what does this mean for me, and what does it mean? For my prospect of re-election and so in that case you're always striving I don't think you could ever afford to be content because if you are content unless you're one of the handful of politicians who are in writings that they will win until they decide not to run anymore yeah. and there aren't that many of them uh, the rest of them are striving and are they content it's a tough life being a politician as well you are on the move you are in Ottawa for chunks of the year. Yeah, it's uh, hard on the relationship. The lifestyle is not healthy mm. in many ways. Relationship, uh, dietary, too much booze. It's a tough life, and I've seen a lot of casualties over the years. Yeah, this is kind of off topic, but it's top of mind right now. And this is uh, Jody Wilson Raybald, who spent 10 times the average for uh, what? Spousal travel. And her excuse was because of this exact point that she wanted to make sure her relationship would which stay which up. I think is fair enough, and I think that there is a, some validity to that, although I would point out that I think her husband did a lot of business in Ottawa too yeah it didn't hurt for them to have that perk right I mean I don't know I haven't looked at this closely to find out how much of his travel was subsidized by her and how much of that might have been work related yeah um, it seems rather a lot compared to her peers. Let's get uh, back to you. We'll start off with your story. You came from Scotland. You worked for the Scotsman. So how did being trained as a journalist in Scotland inform what you're doing in Canada? I was actually trained as a journalist in Canada. I had a bit of a back and forth. So you got this accent in Canada? No, I did a... a degree at Glasgow University, a degree in history, a master's degree in history at McMaster University. I went back to Scotland where I started working as a journalist but then came back to Canada to work, uh, to go to the University of Western Ontario to do a journalism master's. So my formal journalism training was in Canada, although I had already started working in Scotland. I then went back to Scotland and I worked for for uh, the publication I'd worked for before, Post Media, uh, Scott, Scott Media it was called. Yeah. The Scotsman newspaper, and then the Scotsman's sister publication, Scotland on Sunday, which is where I came from directly to the post. Okay, so let's rewind that then. It's a little bit of whiplash there for you. Yeah, so how did your experience working for those Scottish papers inform what you're doing here? Well, I think that the, the, when the post launched, the Daily Telegraph was <clears throat> very much the model. Both were owned by Conrad Black. Yeah. The Telegraph in London? In London. And uh, he brought over... I would say 20 journalists from the UK, of which I was one of my wife, my, my ex-wife was, uh, was a, who was a Canadian journalist, but she was working for the Sunday Times in Glasgow, and I was working for Scotland on Sunday. Through a contact of hers, we met Ken White, who was the launch editor, and he said, if we do this thing, and it wasn't that clear at that point whether they were actually going to proceed with this publication, but he said, if we do it, then you're both in. And the reason they wanted British journalists was because in Glasgow, every morning there were nine newspapers published. Yeah. Many of them were Scottish editions of the, the Mail and the Sun and whatever, but they, but they all had their own staff. Right. And it was an intensely competitive environment, whereas the Canadian newspaper scene was not a, an intensely Canadian, uh, competitive environment. In so Toronto, that, that's something that informed your what? That your, the way that you approached news was that what? You had I think to get it, it out it's faster, still, better? It still approaches even the way I wrote the book. Right. I mean, I didn't take any time off to write that book, and I fired so, it through so almost so I would get out with it first. Before Aaron, uh, Aaron, where he was, I knew he was writing one, and yeah, that kind of competitive edge still informs pretty much everything I do. You want to be first, so I that's want to be why right, you were. I want to be first. <laughs> so that's why you weren't content. You don't have to be first anymore, or you still have to be first. I, I think that the, the the business has changed so much now in the era of. Twitter. Yeah. I had a story the other day which I was, I'd learned that uh, Dominic Barton was going to be named as the, the ambassador to China and I 
thought I had it confirmed, and the person who, who I thought was confirming it, or who, who was telling me not to, to go with it, uh, was actually confirming it, and so I was mad at myself for not getting it out there. But the thing was officially announced three or four hours later. In the era of Twitter, it's not the next morning's newspaper, it's by the minute. Right. So that the, the, the sense of, uh, of waking up in the morning and seeing your story on the front page of a newspaper with an exclusive tag, it's kind of gone. I mean, sometimes it still happens. Bob Fife landed the SNC story. That was an exclusive. He's, do, he's done it again, too, with this uh, cabinet uh, confidentiality story. It's right. not as big, but No, it's but, but him, sometimes but. There, are, there are genuine st- stories that are exclusive, and then there are the ones that remain forever exclusive because they're not really that important. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the CBC, all their stories are exclusive. Which it baffles me because most of them are not that important. But that's maybe a little bit of a knock on the CBC, but, that, but it kind of annoys those of us in the business when it comes out that the CBC has learned something that they probably read in the paper earlier on. But, yeah, the industry has changed. I think that my attitude to... Uh, to that competitive environment has changed too. Yeah, who cares if it comes out five minutes earlier? I mean, who cares? I, I want to. I want to read the most interesting take on it. That's why I. Read and my, and my my job is different as well. I'm now a columnist where I am meant to be providing the context and using experience of having been up here for sixteen years, yeah. rather than being first with a four paragraph story. Anything else you want to say about your life story? No. Nope. Okay. Other than you're content, we've already covered that. We've established that one. Yeah. So let's go with the story of the book itself. When did you have the idea for the book, or did someone approach you with the idea? Um, I was approached, actually. By McClellan and Stewart? Yeah. An editor there? Yeah. Can you divulge the name of that editor? Um... I better not. This has been listened to by people in the book trade. Whether he would mind or not, I don't know. But, okay. but um, sure. my editor there was Doug Pepper. That's oh, that's yeah. a matter of fact. Yeah. Okay. And um, my relationship with Doug was first class. He was an excellent editor. What did he do that was so excellent? Uh, he pushed me. He uh, challenged me to to go further. That's what I think most editors do, even in in newspapers. What does that mean further? Well, you, he would say, can we say this? Can we go? There's a point here I think that you should expand on it. His instincts were good. The instincts of a good editor, and I've been in the business now for 30 years, so I've dealt with some bad ones. But a good editor sees the kernel of something interesting, pushes the writer to expand on it. And, I mean, one example that comes to mind is that he thought that the role of Jared Kushner in the NAFTA negotiations hadn't been explored fully, so should, should I take? I should take a look at it. And, and you know, I didn't, and, and it was so, a useful suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I was the editor, I would have said, spend more time on SNC Lavalin. Well, there is a, you only have the last chapter. There is a story no, it's behind chronological, that. right? But there is a story behind that, though, is that the manuscript was delivered in early January. The baby was delivered in mid-January. <laughs> okay. And... <laughs> I was the on two babies. The two babies, and I was on paternity leave. So I'd covered for the post the first two weeks of SNC. Okay. And then I was gone for five weeks. And I wrote that the rest of that chapter in that five-week period. So there was no time issue per, per se, but I wasn't able to get the kind of uh, insider look at it that I think I got for some of the other chapters. Okay. So it was a logistical issue rather than a conscious decision. Because that's the most interesting thing about Canadian politics right now. I'm not sure, so sure about that. I think there have been there have been a lot of other things that happened over the previous four years that that rival that as far as taking the shine off the sunny days narrative. But I mean, it, it does that. I mean, I think that the, to me, it was a typically Canadian scandal. There was no sex. There was no money exchanged. But um, Trudeau acted in exactly the same fashion that his three immediate predecessors would have, that this uh, obdurate minister was going to be steamrolled, and if not steamrolled, then removed. Yeah. Yeah. And he said he wouldn't do that. To me, that is the story of SNC-Lavalin. 
was there a clear cut case of obstruction of justice? I don't think so. I don't even think Judy Wilson Raybould thinks that. No, but she said it on the record. Um, Post Media is owned by a far right leaning investment firm. Is that right? Which investment firm? I don't know. I just so that's what I've read. Yeah, I don't think that that's that's the case. But if you're talking about the left wing, I, I'm pretty sure that the the bias of the board now. So this is a, it gets complicated because there are owners and there are there's a board of Canadians. Okay. To uh, comply with Canadian ownership regulations, right? The board is clearly and stated this publicly that it is. Uh, right leaning. Yeah. Anybody who's spent five minutes with the National Post knows that. Yeah. yeah. Not a revelation. Okay. So, this is not a flattering portrait of Justin Trudeau. So, why did you write it? It's not ideological, by the way. I think if anybody who gives it a fair shake uh, will see that I'm very complimentary about the way he handled Trump. Yes, that's about the only thing. No, I think that if you look at the, the way, his campaigning abilities, the fact that he yeah. won a seat against... It's a double-edged sword, though. Against all odds. Yeah. No, no, I think well, he, uh, uh, no, he... No, the glad-handing and the, uh, the the marketing and the substance yeah. isn't there, but the style is there. No, I think when you... when you, That may have become the... Uh, the spin machine around him as he won power as liberal leader. Uh, that machine was not around him in Papineau in 2007, in 2008 when he won, won that seat. Yeah. He won that seat through hard sheer work. hard work. Yeah. Yeah. And it was not an easy seat to win. It was held by the block. Uh, he was the underdog. No, I think there are a number of occasions there in the, in the book which, which are fair to Justin Trudeau as a, as a retail politician. As a person, I mean, I think he's a decent man. He has he has great, uh, good intentions. I think my criticism of him is that he should not be judged on good intentions. It should be judged on results. And I think that so the you the asked results about, aren't good though because the book is is basically a, there's a litany of uh, mistakes and little scandals and screw ups and broken promises. That I mean, it's that's what the whole book is. What was it that? Uh, I think it was Mencken who said, I don't make jokes, I just record the facts. <laughs> right? I mean, this, um, you know, I, I, I interviewed him uh, just before the 2015 election. And he's always called me cynical. And I, I mean, I've known him since 2006. So when I was at Sydney, he was so cynical. Yeah. And anybody who, is, who does not see things the precise way that he sees them, is judged to be cynical, and I was cynical or before. Or sinful, you say. Sinful. Well, that, we can get into that, but that's another construct of it. Yeah. Is, the, is this vision of the anointed? Yeah. And if you're not, you're not only in, if you don't believe and agree with them, you're not only in error, you're in sin. Yeah. And I think that uh, that even before the fact, before it even got into power, there were just so many promises, so many of them out with the gift of the federal government like saying he's going to implement all 94 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, recommendations, one of which was to get the Pope to apologise. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, he, he, I, he over-promised and under-delivered. Right. So I was sceptical, even before they got into power. But to him, that is cynical. And uh, you I mean, are... Reporting the facts is cynical. And being sceptical that, that anybody... He can't be happy with you for having written this. Well, that's not that you care either here or there, but... Because you're content. Well, I think I, I gave, I, I called it as I see it. And I've known Jerry Butts since for, for, uh, for 16, 17 years. And I, I knew him at Queen's Park. And I always remember the thing I've always said to him when he complains to me that I, I've got it all wrong. Yeah. Is that uh, they don't pay me to call it the way it isn't. Right. And that's the way I see it. And if people don't like it, then that's, I guess, their problem. Okay, so I'm still still on this. Why did you write it? Because uh, because the timing is interesting. I mean, you you obviously want to sway 
public opinion, you don't want him to win again. And it seems to me your board probably doesn't want him to win again. Well, uh, the board, has, nobody on, in manage, management has spoken to me about this, but there's been no connection. With, the, imagine they're fairly happy about it. I think they're fairly happy that a National Post writer is garnering some publicity for having written a book. Did but you, you, but, your, book but, your, but your comment that I don't want him to win is presumptuous. And while you contemplate an apology for thinking how I, how I vote... Uh, I will answer the rest of your question. I uh, I don't vote as a matter of course. Oh, that's the that's the worst possible route. No, I think it's it's fair enough. Do you at least go in and refuse your vote, or you just don't even show? Well, up? most times I'm uh, I'm somewhere where I'm not in my own writing because because okay. uh, I'm covering the election. But I think there's many of us as reporters. Terrible, terrible example. Many of us rep uh, as reporters say we don't vote explicitly so that we cannot be accused of being in one camp or the other. Right. And that is the that is the uh, the gospel. Okay. I'll just add, by the way, if he doesn't this win, like if he doesn't win, there's no paperback. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anything more on the book? Yeah, the book uh, cover. That's uh, pretty dramatic. It's uh, just Trudeau putting his hands through his hair. Looking, he's smiling. Um, did you have anything to do with the cover? Nothing. Nope, nope. You just approved it. Well, I guess I approved. It. I didn't oppose it. I think it's terrific. Yeah, I think of it. So, so what does it say to you? It says that things haven't gone according to plan. I think. I mean, the education of a prime minister, which was not my line, but I, but I think it's a good one, is hinting at this: the idea that. that this third party made third party promises, yeah, two hundred and thirty odd promises, which they then expanded to three hundred and sixty four when they got sent the mandate letter out to ministers. In a country that was designed to withstand change, I mean, the 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 system of Westminster system of government is designed to withstand change, as we saw with every attempt to reform the Senate, except for Trudeau's, by the way. And you asked me if you you said. Where were you complimentary? Well, one thing I was complimentary about was his um, his Senate appointment system, because I think that the, you, we we learned from the Supreme Court reference that you cannot uh, make the Senate an elected chamber. We know that you can't abolish it, and there is going, never going to be provincial approval to make substantive changes other than the one he's made, mm -hmm. and I think it's a good thing. Um, you don't say quite that in the book. I, I think I do. Uh, you you might want to reread it. Uh, well, uh, that's what I plan to do. I, I no, uh, but I don't think it comes across that positive. Well, I, I, I say that there are a number of occasions. No, I, it may not come across positive because it's hindered his legislative agenda, and I don't think they thought that through. Okay. And a lot of their MPs don't think they thought that through because they did not achieve as much on the legislative front as they set out to, or as many other majority governments have. But just to finish the thought on the country designed to withstand change, you know, yep. clearly the federal system where you've got powerful provincial governments, the geography of Canada, all of these things mean that trying to do the things that Trudeau promised he would do and did not brook any suggestions that he would not be able to do it, yeah. Uh, it just made shows, it all unlikely. It shows almost like an ignorance of the country, because it is such a, an impossible country to to, to govern. Well, if making it was all of these promises, if it was ignorance, it was willful ignorance. What? Well, it's one of these cases where you just make as many promises as you can because that's how you get elected. I think that's evident. I mean, remember the the key phrase is third party promises. Yeah, they were the third party, and I don't think it's hail mary. There was, I mean, there are people in government who were who were telling me, look, whenever I I said, how are we going to do all this stuff, and the answer was, we'll worry about that when we get into power. Yeah, yeah. Which is, when you think about that, that's the very definition of cynical. Yeah. Um, you talk about the education of a prime minister. So what he learned? Well, I think what he's learned is that it's a harder place to govern than 
he anticipated and that it'll so, be interesting to see this platform because I think this platform will be much less sweeping much more promises that are easier to implement the one he's just come out with is on uh, expanding the first time home buyers cr- benefit which is within the gift of the Department of Finance I mean they can do that pretty easily mm. uh, it hits their revenue but it's an easy thing to do so you know there'll be fewer things that rely on the approval of provincial governments um, yes. international agreements etc 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 so he's following Harper there by by sort of ignoring the provinces or well he kind of did that early on though there was a there was a uh, there was an environment minister's meeting on the day that he announced that the he was going to bring in the carbon tax I mean people walked out of the meeting because they were thinking well what the heck's the the point of consulting the provinces if you're just going to ride roughshod. Yeah. He also implemented a take it or leave it health deal, which was, uh, in my mind, a great a great achievement because it has saved the country sixty billion dollars. But from the point of view of a government that was going to come in and be a consensual government and and everybody would sit around the table and sing kumbaya, uh, it so was anyways. it was not what was envisaged. How do you feel about Aaron Weary's book? Are you annoyed or glad that there's competition? Or no, I don't think is anybody glad about co- anybody who's in business and says they're glad about competition is lying? Okay, but because um, you're both I exploiting annoyed? a marketing opportunity here, right? But I mean, there's plenty of room. Yeah, but you're number one. I'm not this week. <laughs> number he's, nine. He's not number one. No, he's number seven, I think, in the star chart. <laughs> so are you keeping tabs together? Uh, no, my publisher just sent me the list this morning. Okay. Uh, your uh, we did we mentioned your wife and the fact that she's a diplomat. Did that help you in writing the book? Did she give you all sorts of internal no. stuff that was happening? No, and I, let me make that absolutely clear in case anybody's listening. No, I mean we have Chinese walls between uh, uh, whatever she does at work. By the way, she's on maternity leave, so she has none. She has no. Uh, Again. No, well, the baby's young. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought maybe you'd had another one. No, no. Having another one. No, no. Okay, um, sorry. But no, I mean, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into uh, Trudeau then, now that we've left the book. You say that we're not accustomed to having prime ministers with lofty aspirations, and yet his father wanted a just society, which is pretty lofty. Uh, Pearson brought in uh, pensions and health care. Maroney brought in free trade. These aren't dinky little aspirations. No, but I think it would, if you look at what's happened since free trade, I mean, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, I first came here in 1988 when Maroney was in there has not much change to the structure of the, co- the country since then. I mean, he mm. tried to bring in uh, Charlatan Accord. Um, I think that I proved, just what I'm saying proves though, the point. I'm, uh, but I'm just saying that it, 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 there's asp- you know there's some major aspirations among uh, Canadian prime ministers in the past. I mean, you suggest that, that I would say that it's different because he's got these a- aspirations. Well, if you look at the the history of the Chrétien government. And the Harper governments in particular, they were both incrementalists. They were both pretty much of the view that boring government is good government. Yeah, practical. Practical. You know, if if you don't need to do anything, don't do anything. Don't be in the in the media every day. Um, yeah, keep your head down. I mean, and then I cite the case of Bill Davis, who was yeah bland, bland works. I mean, I think that. Uh, Canadians are comfortable with that. Mm. I think it's more the exception when a Prime Minister comes along and says we're going to revolutionise the way we do things around here. Well, especially on so many different fronts. Uh, right. And that, you know, I mean, that, if there was a central criticism is that they were just too ambitious. There was just no way any of this was going to happen. But the, but the point mm. is, they said it was all going to happen. They didn't say, uh, you know, I can't promise anything, but we're, this is what we're going to try to do. They said... We're doing it, and anybody who says we're not doing it is a liar. This is where we can get in our uh, anointed stuff. 
Uh, you read a book, obviously, that had a big uh, influence on you. The the Vision of the Anointed by Thomas Sowell, yeah, yeah. who was um, an American thinker, is an American thinker, and uh, a small-c conservative thinker. He's very um, sceptical about the government intervention and, and the the results that follow from government intervention. It's always seems to me that the uh, the intentions are good and the results are quite often lousy. Mm-hmm. And that has yeah. been my observation of having covered government for 20 years or so. So the only reason you wrote this book was to make money? Uh, I think if you tally up the amount of hours and then divide it by the or divide the pay by the number of hours, it is sub-minimal wage. It is not a way to make money. Okay, so You're in the book industry, right? You know that nobody makes money out of no, no, Canadian no. books. That's for damn sure, especially podcasters. Uh, so you haven't answered my question, why'd you write it? It's because someone told you to? No, no, I think that at some point I always wanted to write a book. I think that I had contemplated a Harper book, and I was ideally placed to write a Harper book. Yeah. I should probably have written a Harper book, and I didn't. Mainly because I just thought the idea of writing for, you know, I'm at work eight hours and then going home and writing about Harper again, yeah, yeah, it just yeah. wasn't that interesting. I mean, yeah. there was a narrative here. Yeah. I could see a story here in a way I couldn't really see a story in Harper. Um, this is a colleague of yours, Chris Sally. He tweeted out, yesterday one interesting thing about these three leaders he's talking about the debate as opposed to Trudeau is that they actually talk like regular human beings thought that was bang on yeah it was a strange evolution and I think you know when we're talking about the education of a prime minister his language is part of that education I mean he came into to politics and he would constantly riff and he got in a lot of trouble you know from saying as the leader of the liberal party that the senate works for us and he meant quebecers because we've got more representation and people in the west went bananas mm-hmm. um when he was asked about china uh, which regime do you admire well china because they can get things done mm-hmm. uh you know you can go on and on there were just when he was talked about he talked about uh the invasion of Ukraine and said, well, Russia will be mad because we beat them at hockey. Uh, he was asked about um, about yeah. the inter- intervention in Syria. Well, we'll whip out our CF-18s. You know, all these things led to him being sat down and told... You can't be yourself. SFU. Yeah, you can't be yourself. Because the response to the growth gate was just... It was legalese. Why didn't he just say, "Listen, I was drunk. I was a bit of a jerk. My, you know, my, I was upset about my brother. Uh, this isn't right. What I did was wrong. Um, I deeply regret it. I apologize to her. Uh, what the hell else do you want me to do?" But he never said that. He said, "What was the line? What was the line?" Um, it was. Well, he didn't recall it. He didn't recall he, he any incident in particular. He used some legal term, and it was just like, yeah. please, just be real. Yeah, well, he's, I think, and I've got a quote here from um, John McLaughlin Gray, who was a playwright and wrote for the Globe and Mail. When, people, when normal people enter politics, they transform themselves into tri- cartoons because they're no longer <laughs> permitted to express embarrassment, angst, mortification, anger, surprise, wonder, or doubt. And... You know, the spin doctors around Trudeau at the time, this was around the time of um, some of the gas we're just talking about, um, that that he had to sort of get a grip and not just shoot from the mouth. They they would sometimes say that he would say the right things the wrong way when he was talking about 24 senators from Quebec and only six from Alberta and six from British Columbia. That's to our advantage, he said. As the leader of the Liberal Party, (laughs) a national party. I prefer that to what we're getting now. Well, I mean... So there was a lot of a few questions I've had on this book mm. compared to our worries was that um, that he had a lot of access to the prime minister and and you didn't. Yeah. Well, I I did have a sit down interview with him for the book and I'd had numerous others, but I tend to find he doesn't say anything <laughs> that's, that's because right. there's so much on message track nowadays. 
that uh, it, it must is be frustrating as a journalist. Well, I mean, if you watch a press conference, it's almost pointless because mm-hmm. there's really, really a, a straight answer at the end of it. So that's what he learned. Then he learned basically, don't be myself. Well, I think when it comes to speaking in public, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the one that always stands out to me is um, so the, the the times that he's been a little bit more freewheeling are in these town halls where it's members of the public, and I guess he feels a little bit obliged to not just be the the rote answers that he gives to journalists. And he's done a pretty good job in them, by and large. He did he did one in Nanaimo where he was talking about um, pipelines and advocating for pipelines in an environment that was very hostile to that mm-hmm. on that issue. Mm-hmm. And I thought he was terrific. I mean, he, he basically took them head on and, and it made the case. And by the end of it, most people in that room would have walked out thinking better of Justin Trudeau than when, when they walked in. But then at other times, because he's off the leash a little bit, he says something like he did to the, to the soldier, the, the veteran in Edmonton, who stood up, rolled up his pant leg and showed a prosthetic leg that, he'd, that was the result of a... a, a bomb in Afghanistan and the vet was asking him about uh, the Omar Khadr settlement 10 million bucks 10 million bucks, how come you're giving Omar Khadr 10 million bucks when you're still fighting veterans in court and his answer was as awful as any I've ever, ever heard him give when he said well they're asking for more than we can give right now and the crowd started booing so wait a minute, he was way off message there so you're saying that he's what well, I think I, I'm saying I, he's that, supposed to be empathetic, though. Right, but but I'm saying that in those in that environment, uh, he's a little bit mo- more uh, unplugged than than uh, but, than but, he is in normal circumstances. And yeah. and the reason that we are now having a short general election campaign, and he's not and he's showing not, up for debates, and he's not showing up for debates, is that they do not want him to make another. They're asking for more than we can give statement. I mean, one of those in the middle of the English language debate could be fatal. So that's their biggest concern, is that this guy is... And when I say that his strengths are also his weaknesses, yeah. so he, his strengths and his empathy and that being a little bit more uh, approachable than, than, than Harper, for sure, uh, were what got him there, but they may be what bring them down in the end. And I think they're going to be very careful about the exposure that they give him in this election campaign. Because I, I think that's pathetic, hiding the real man from the, the voters. I mean, that is pathetic. Well, that's what's happening. I mean, we, we the only time he's not being hit is in Quebec on the TVA debate because they see Quebec as being so crucial. Yeah, you put it very nicely. Uh, you quote the seventeenth century playwright John Webster whether we fall by ambition, blood or lust like diamonds we are cut with our own dust I think that is encapsulates the previous five minutes I've just <laughs> yeah that's why I brought it up yeah you wish you could write like that or beautiful yeah. well at least you found it yeah Mm. Reflect in his glory. Well, speaking of which, uh, there's some good humor in your book. Congratulations uh, for that. I uh, that's one of my criteria for a good book. Uh, for example, uh, you talk about Trudeau looking like he was from the pages of People magazine, but uh, Stefan Dion looked like he stepped from the pages of Current Sociology. <laughs> Uh, you quote him here. This is one of the only times I've seen him use humor, and he says, well, "You know, something that you say. What did he learn?" And he responded with, "When in British Columbia, in the interior, wave with your whole hand. In politics, some days you're a dog, some you're a tree." I'll just I'll just come up with one more here. You're not laughing at your own material, though, I see. I've heard it before. Plus, it's not good to laugh at your own material. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, actually, I wasn't sure about the wording here. Trudeau's task in choosing ministers was also helped. I kind of thought it should be wasn't helped 
by the fact that the caucus was stuffed with mediocrities who thought they were Socrates. Well, it was helped by the fact that they weren't contenders. I see. So he I mean, didn't have a lot to of worry the, about any competition then. The Liberal caucus of this time around was a kind of odd mix. And the guy who did most of the recruiting told me that it's a, entirely a function of polling. And in 2014, in the fall, they were polling pretty high. And they got some pretty good people, some pretty good people committed, many of whom languished on the back bench and some of whom have now decided politics is not for them. But as they went through 2015, they fell 10 points in the polls. They were, they were in the lead and then they ended up third place um, because of support for the, uh, the uh, Harper Bill 50, C-51 and, and, and other things. Through the spring of 2015... Recruitment dried up, and this guy, and this guy's words, they were left with some borderline idiots. Um, Bobble, but, bobbleheads. Uh, but unfortunately, most of the borderline idiots didn't realize they were or are borderline idiots. Right. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, I'm just going to do a bit more humor here, uh, even though you as an audience, not good. No. No. But. Uh, the legislative agenda was moving at the pace of coastal erosion. A system administered by bureaucrats zealous in their protection of the public's right to remain ignorant. I firmly believe that. And um, this is the British Columbia pr uh, um, Premier Horgan he knocked a glass of water off his podium at the joint press conference and deadpanned spills can happen anywhere. Right. Because obviously they're concerned about an oil spill from the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's funny, the, uh, the tr team around Trudeau, another thing they told him was don't try to be funny. Because I don't you're think not. you can though, yeah. Right. That's, yes. Which is kind of sad because I think I mean, and you say he's intelligent, right? He's not stupid at all. Um, no. But uh, I think that uh, good sense of humor is a sign of intelligence. So if he doesn't have any sense of humor, he must well, have. He has a sense of humor, but it's kind of quirky, and um, and most people wouldn't find it funny. I mean, as I said, I think in a column past, his sense of humor is no laughing matter. Should use that in the book. Well, the fa it, the thing is, though, if no one laughs at your jokes, yeah. then... I mean, he tried... What was it? He, he thought it was funny that when he was in Papineau in uh, 2008 and somebody had written to his blog saying, would the Charter of Human Rights apply to E.T.? And he did a long, <laughs> a long expose of why E.T. would be okay because the Charter would apply to him, and to which La Presse drew a cartoon which showed a... a E.T. that looked remarkably like Stéphane Dion giving Trudeau the finger. Actually, that brings up the next uh, sort of accolade I'm going to give you here, and that's the book is is uh, has got a lot of nice little nuggets of political wisdom in it. Um, particularly speaking of E.T., don't answer hypothetical questions. Artifice must be concealed with ease and grace. That was Michael Ignatius' line. Yeah. If people are looking for a, a, a sort of book on politics that kind of easy read, it's uh, Ignatius' book, which uh, is called Fire and Ashes, Success and, and Failure in Politics. And I thought it was a terrific book, and I think he did a really good job in it. And I've used it a lot as for, um, you know, he talked about himself, and he talked about how uncomfortable he felt being a politician. And this sense of hollowness, and I contrast that with Justin Trudeau, who never ever felt like that. He thought he found his calling, and he thrives off crowds. There's an anecdote in there. He from does the energy that he gets off a crowd, and someone else doesn't. Ignatiev, right? and Ignatiev yeah. walked through the the crowd and sat down in the green room exhausted. And yeah. Trudeau had to tell him, "You've got to feed off that energy." Yeah, yeah. and I think that's. Natural politicians do that, and, and 
unnatural ones like Ignatiev don't. Uh, you also mentioned this, this idea of repetition and how you have to repeat your message. And I can't stand the, the middle class and those working hard to join it. It's such bullshit, and they repeat it over Still, and over again. It's just such I mean, horseshit. Four years later, it is uh, worn out its welcome, probably. But it's four their years ago. fairness. Their fairness. Uh, you talk about their fairness narrative. Yeah, yeah. It is um, definitely due a reboot as far as a, a campaign phrase. But, you know, I think Catherine McKenna was caught on camera saying this. You know, we, we say things loudly in the House of Commons and then we say it again even more loudly and that's the only way it gets through because people do not pay, between writs, do not pay any attention to politics. Yeah, here's that line about uh, Canada, governing Canada. Politics in Canada is the art of the possible and not much is possible. And here, a little bit of alliteration here. Canada is a country fashioned and frustrated by its geography. I think that is uh, one of the lessons he will have learned in the last four years. Yeah. You get to uh, 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 a few lines about his empathy and the fact that, now I don't know if it's he thinks that that's more important than technical competence. Or in general, in politics, empathy is more important than... I think that that line was from, um, was advice that he got from Obama's people. Okay. Uh, if that's the same reference. Um, he was running against Harper, who was acknowledged as being strong on the economy. That was, the, 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 the polling suggested that the, the Canadians believed he was strong on the economy. Yeah. Um, stronger than Trudeau. But Obama's people told... Trudeau's people that the in the American experience, when Obama was against Romney, who was also a judge to be stronger on the economy than Obama, it wasn't that factor that was the key. It was, did you have empathy for me in my plight? Did you care about me? Will you try and get me ahead rather than increase GDP growth? Communicating that message, right? Right. And I think that uh, they learn that lesson mm -hmm. and executed on it pretty well because I think the public thought we were going into recession in uh, in summer 2015 and in fact we did I mean technically the the second quarter was negative 0.1 growth so you know when that number comes out people are looking for somebody to steward the economy and Somehow they turned to Trudeau. There must be a reason why they turned to Trudeau and not Harper. Harper had outworn his yeah, welcome. Thing. People want to change after People want to change, but they obviously felt comfortable enough in Trudeau. In a way, they didn't with Dion. In 2008 with Dion, yeah. we were going into the Great Recession, and the country was looking for somebody who knew who could handle the economy and a leader, and they judged Dion to be neither. Yeah. Whereas with Trudeau, there was a sense that he could do this. Well, uh, they also stressed, his team stressed the fact that things were less fair under Harper and now we were going to be fair. Yeah, I think that that was a, a huge part of their victory was that uh, they, they didn't campaign on income inequality as a, as a subject, but this idea of fairness to the middle class, reducing the, uh, the middle band of income tax and... and um, increasing the top band, which again they said would be revenue neutral. Of course it wasn't revenue neutral because any economist who ever looked at a thing called the Laffer curve realises that when you put up taxes people pay less. Mm -hmm. They either avoid or they shift money into other vehicles. And the whole small business tax debacle which followed the following year was because the money had moved into these tax vehicles. Yeah. Well the other thing too is that tax attempt to collect more tax from the rich hit the donors and the right. donors said I'm not paying your right. to that, your party that's what closed it down that right? was a, a big factor the following year for sure the other one thing though that did, that was the, I think the key for many people was that Harper did not want to cut services running into the 2015 election because he thought it would be obviously 
uh, adverse publicity for that. But he wanted to balance the books. That meant they had no money to spend. So when the when Trudeau came out and said we're not going to bother balancing the books, yeah. he came out with this whopping Canada Child Benefit, which is a huge amount of money. It's twenty two billion dollars a year, more than any other program. I'm pretty sure, more than the defence budget. For a lot of people, that made a big difference. It helped them, you mean? For sure. I mean, the, the numbers that, that they're quoting that, that uh, this measure took out of poverty are not made up. But they're, just, people they're, were they're financing it with a deficit, though. So that's my big problem, is that you know somebody sometime has got to pay for this. Yeah, and it's the future generation. And it's the future generation. If you didn't care about deficit, you could do an awful lot of stuff. And you know the only thing that stops most governments from doing that is that somebody some point is going to pay it back. Well, you talk about it, uh, typically there's a bit of tension between the Prime Minister and a, a Minister of Finance where there isn't that in this government. No, I think that, um, I mean, even people inside the government are telling me that finance is a vassal state of of the PMO. Yeah. The, the, the PMO is more all-encompassing in this government than, than in any I've covered, and I think, in any Canada's history. That's funny because that was a criticism of Harper. Right, but uh, but Flaherty's finance department was a semi-autonomous state. They were not always eye to eye, and I think they, they more or less got along, but there is no question as to who's in charge here. And there's a book just come out by, uh, I don't have it here, but uh, Donald Savoy, uh, Democracy in Canada, and he makes, this is the sort of uh, his magnum opus after 45 years of studying governance in Canada, and he makes the case that we've now reached the the zenith of, of uh, central power. It's not a healthy development. I mean, Trudeau came in and said cabinet is back. Cabinet's not back. Cabinet is a focus group for the prime minister. Yeah. Decisions are made by the courtiers around the unelected the king, ones. The unelected courtiers around the king, and caucus is <laughs> nowhere. Speaking of tension, you talk about the grand bargain between a clean environment and a strong economy. It sounds like an oxymoron. Well, the the polling suggested that you could get majority support in most provinces if you were going to bring in a carbon tax and build a pipeline. And on paper, I think it seemed like a good thing. This is again where I struggle with this government in that in that uh, good intentions don't inevitably lead to results, um, and that government intervention is also all often has unintended consequences. Um, you know, as we saw very soon after this plan was sort of unveiled, the government of British Columbia changed, and we had an NDP government propped up with the Greens. So this pipeline, which they had turned down every other alternative, Northern Gateway, Energy East, uh, by putting a tanker ban on the west coast, they blocked any chance of building a pipeline to Prince Rupert, of which there are sort of nascent proposals. So it was this. It was Trans Mountain or nothing, and the government of British Columbia didn't want it. Mm-hmm. And because of that, Rachel Notley pulled out of the uh, carbon pricing scheme. Yeah. So the whole thing starts unraveling, and we still haven't. It still hasn't been put back together again. We still don't have a pipeline, and we still we own one though. We own one, <laughs> but um, but that the, the idea of having both things has not come to pass. It's uh, yeah, it's not clear it ever will. Yeah. Just winding down here, uh, I just want to get in the hyenas uh, eating a wildebeest. <laughs> what was that in reference to? That's the uh, Minister of Defence in the House of Commons. Yes, yeah, yeah, that was unfortunate for him. Uh, he had claimed he that was, he was the architect of Operation Medusa in Afghanistan. Uh, he was, in fact, involved in Operation Medusa as a, a reservist... I'm trying to remember his rank. Was he a major or a lieutenant? I can't remember. And he earned medals for for valor. And he is a brave man, and he's a uh, an honourable man. But f- he made a claim he should never have made, and was forced to stand up and apologise for it eleven times in one question period, as I recall. The military looks very dimly on stolen valor. So as the defence minister, uh, he was not in a good place. And I think most many other prime ministers might have cut their defence minister loose at that point. It's it's a remarkable thing of this government. Loyalty, right? The team that brought him there is still intact, and you know, arguably, it should not be. But the senior ministers and um, 
well, wait a minute. Apart from Dirty Wilson, Ray Bowler, James Jane. Philpott. Yeah. These were, um, but but in his in his eyes, they had not been loyal to him. Yeah. So they didn't deserve any loyalty back. It's a very uh, a bit of a perverse view of loyalty, I suppose. Um, I'm just going to try one one more humorous of your own humorous lines on you. Three of four Canadians. This is both when uh, they had had been uh, elected leaders of their uh, respective parties. Three of four Canadians would not be able to pick Sheer or Singh out of a police lineup. I think that's probably about right. Yeah. That number, actually, that number is based on polling. It may be lower now, and it certainly will be lower after the end of the election campaign, but it speaks to the fact that that uh, Trudeau has rock star level of recognition, and his political opponents don't. And for people who spend three minutes a week thinking about politics, you know, that's important. I mean, yeah. talking to the guys who do these focus groups, they say the level of knowledge out there is depressingly low. And all they can really hope for is that they might tune in for five minutes during the English language debate. That's really sad, yeah. I'm just going to read out two quotes here. But voters don't vote for or against policy platforms. They vote for leaders they can trust, whom they feel comfortable supporting and as Republican strategist Frank Luntz told a gathering of influential conservatives in 2006, his research suggested that people would rather vote for someone they trust than someone who agrees with them on the 10 issues they care about most. So my question is, can we trust Justin Trudeau? Well, I think that that is the... $64,000 question. I mean, I think that that will be what, what we find out in this election. Trust uh, as We'll find out that, yes, Canadians do trust him, but we don't know. I mean, I my suspect, question is, can we trust I him? I suspect that we will find out that that they do trust him. No, I, I didn't ask you about them. I, I said, I'm asking you, because you know him better than most, much better. I think if he, he stands there and says I'm going to uh, get the Pope to apologise for Canadian government's uh, residential schools policy no and I think that they've, they're, they've over promised but I was going to talk about the concept of trust and it is a different it's a, it's a powerful concept and it, it's what all political strategists I think try to get their head around and it's it's not would you trust the person to give you back their wallet because you know I think by and large most politicians are honest people and they probably would be but it's about, it's about trust about can I trust him to look after my interests and has he got my best interests at heart as opposed to big corporations right um, or the Liberal Party's interests or, or whatever the, the competing uh, alternatives might be. And, you know, this comes down to this idea of empathy and um, connection. And I think that that connection has not been broken with Justin Trudeau yet. Despite SNC-Lavalin, which most people don't know the intricacies of it, they don't particularly, do they care about the, the, the judicial system might be compromised? They're more worried about, am I better off after four years? Can I trust this individual to ensure I'm better off again in four years' time? I think that, that uh, from that point of view, that bond has not yet been broken. People are unhappy with Justin Trudeau in isolation on any number of issues but he's not judged in isolation in a general election he's judged in comparison to his political peers political rivals yeah it's relative it's relative and um, if you look at the wording in their campaign strategy you can see that they're talking about it being a choice they're saying choose forward 
it's it's not saying well they're basically acknowledging they would not been as brilliant in government as they would have don't look have you believe yeah but we've got this far we're going to finish the job now. Mm -hmm. um, you're evading my question well so from my point of view I mean you're asking me my political my p no. political I'm, I'm you've written a book about someone yeah. you've written a biography yeah so so what's the question again do you trust I know you've been trying to give me a, a kind of a, a, a context for the word trust right but, so uh, I mean do I trust him if, if I drop my wallet trust him to give me it back yeah right do I trust him to fulfill all of the things that he says he's going to to do for the country no I don't but that's my point is that it's the politicians do that though that's the problem they do it but he's done it particularly uh, egregious. egregiously yeah. <laughs> for he did four years ago I think he'll be less egregious this time so that's what he's learned. Don't be so egregious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ambitious, but yeah. I mean, it's pretty. It was pretty apparent to anybody who'd been around Oliver more than five minutes that this was not a realistic platform, and it all stemmed from that. Um, anything else you want to say about the book? About what you want to leave people, why they should read it, uh, what you want to leave them with? Well, it was a first draft of, of history, if you ignore Twitter. I mean, it was written quickly. Did you string together a bunch of your columns? I cited a bunch of my columns, mainly because I was there at the time for most of this stuff. You know, I, I witnessed this. Why would I rewrite something that I'd written that day? You know, I mean, be like, that's the most accurate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, this is my impression for, because I'm writing columns. I'm writing uh, my opinions and impressions from standing in front of him uh, when he unveiled his fairness platform, or, or when I sat with him in a, the back room of an auditorium in New Brunswick in 2013, or when I met him at the Liberal uh, Leadership Convention in 2006, uh, or when I played in a rugby match with him against with the Canadian international rugby team you know would not have made sense for me to try and rewrite any of that so I mean I didn't cut and paste it but I, I certainly mm. cited it there are no secondary sources for this government yet you can't go to the library and yeah. pull out cabinet documents the way John English did for his, the biography of his father which you really admire right? I thought it was a I mean it was a two volume it probably didn't need to be too long. I would have preferred it to be one, but um, but the first but it was exhaustive. Was good, right? Oh, it was exhaustive, and it was it was it was not the same type of book I was writing. Yeah. And I deliberately write in a kind of journalistic style. It was meant to be read, read, and therefore be relatively concise um, and chrono chronological. I think people find that easier to read than a thematic thing that leaps back and forward. So, I mean, I, I, there are weaknesses in that book, I'm, I'm damn sure. Um, but I think it's, it stands up, and um, I think it will stand up even after the election. Because it, the main point of it is, is that Canadians are not as progressive as Justin Trudeau thinks we are. Mm -hmm. And even if he gets elected with a majority, it is not a the public embracing him and all his works and everything he's done over the last four years because there is a clear reluctance yeah, to, yeah. to re-elect him. The, the, there was a poll last week which suggested only 13% of Canadians have committed to re-electing Justin Trudeau, which is a pretty damning indictment of his last four years. Well, I it's think the least worst option. The least worst option. is that That's my... Uh, I used that in a column last week where um, mm. I was talking about Britain. Tony Blair in 2001 had come in in a wave of euphoria similar to Trudeau, had disappointed over four years, but got re-elected in what was known as the apathetic landslide. Right. Because people had judged him the least worst option. And we may have our own apathetic landslide. Hmm. And so you're happy with the, the role that your book has played? 
Yeah, I think so. I think it's... Uh, what have you done? It's basically uh, taken your work over the last number of years and turned it into a lovely object. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm proud of it. can be referred to now and in the future. I, always, I mean, I think that there, all there ever will be is words. And um, unfortunately, newspaper words are wrapping fish and lining bird cages before too long. So I'm, I am pleased to have done it. Yeah. Well, I'm pleased to have talked to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've been speaking to John Iveson, who is the Ottawa bureau chief of the National Post newspaper here in Ottawa, Canada. Thanks again. Thank you.